Hello friends, welcome back to the Egyptian art. In continuation of our discussion on Egyptian art, in the last episode, if we look at again the huge imposing sculptural representations of the kings or pharaohs, we can find that they are rigid, static and they suppress spontaneous forms of expression. All of them embrace a stereotyped style, leaving little room for individual expression. They are therefore very much anti-individualistic and predominantly devoid of the feeling of intimacy. As a result of these features, they come to represent a group hailing from a higher degree of reality, a group towering above the day-to-day -day reality, a group in which every member identifies himself or herself with a super-individual and superhuman stature. This elite notion that the royal class holds fast to themselves goes hand in hand with the impersonal and anti-individual characteristics of their expressions in the images. It is further supplemented by the fact that the kings and pharaohs are shown with textual references to their self-glorifying autobiographical descriptions inscribed on their statues from the very beginning of the sculptural tradition. The Old Kingdom sculptures are comparatively richer in individual features, which later completely fizzle out. In the Middle Kingdom, without leaving a trace of individual characters, portrait sculptures reached a greatest point of idealization and abstraction. It marks a significant phase wherein portraits of kings tend to be sheer representative images identified by text inscribed on them. However, these features mentioned earlier were restricted to the representations of gods and kings. The superhuman, impersonal look, the idealized and otherworldly expression of the pharaohs goes well in tune with the self-glorified concept of the ruler. The pharaoh was not only the ultimate political power, he was the religious head chosen by God. He was the God himself. This was the Egyptians' belief as well as the king himself. The worship of the gods therefore extended to the worship of the king too. The representation of pharaohs thus always was refined with regularity of features and the calm of face combined with astonishing gaze unmindful of the spectator or people before them as their look ignores us staring into an infinite space. In contrast to this, we can see that Egyptian canon also regulated the representation of working people. The solemn and grandier expression is absolutely absent in the portrayal of workers or common men. In the painting and reliefs, the people engaged in various works are often shown in multiple postures and views in which artists could enjoy a great deal of freedom in favor of realism. Perhaps it was necessary to make the workers' engagement precise and clear. In essence, he was not a significant individual worth to be portrayed, but a producer. A producer has to be shown unmistakably what he was producing. The rigorous, static and unvarying formalism of Egyptian art was not completely a result of a natural development of style nor was it entirely determined by aesthetic considerations. Its pictorial formula, to a considerable extent, was shaped by forces external to art, which cannot be explained by reasons within the frame of art. There are many instances to prove that Egyptian artists had surprising power of observation and technical skill to translate into the visual what was observed. The physical features of hands, legs, etc. of human figures and that of animals and birds as detailed in many works come to reassert the point that the deviation from the imitation of reality in Egyptian art does not refer to the artist's inability to cope with it. Rather, the stubborn formalism of Egyptian art must be understood as a matter of intention than as an easy and comfortable technique. The law of frontality and related canons as we have seen 
strictly applied to kings and dignitaries basically served the interest of a royal class to present themselves in majestic manner and lend them with otherworldly superreal effect. The Egyptian art with its formal device that we are familiar with so far could satisfy this strong felt interest behind the representation. So much so that Egyptian art remained unchanged as long as the social and political life made unvarying stride. The moment political and social life starts giving up the old and conventional system, the change immediately reflects in every field of art. In its force, artist fails to hold back the old system, as he is always an integral part of the whole social system. And in ancient society, he is directly connected with political dictates. Such a change is perceptible in Egyptian art with the emergence of Amenhotep IV of the New Kingdom. The regime of Amenhotep witnessed a great cultural revolution. He freed Egypt from polytheism and religious exploitation by priesthood. Instead, he introduced monotheism, the worship of a single god called Aten, identified with sun, and rechristened his name to Akhenaten, the dearest to Aten. Akhenaten left Thebes, the capital of the empire, which was dominated by the priesthood of Amen, and established Amarna as his new capital. The art flourished there under his instruction comes to represent a glorious episode, however brief in the long history of Egypt. He ordered his artists to depict the true image of reality. He wanted to be portrayed what exactly he looked like, without embellishing his features, without glorifying his majesty. Moreover, he did not confine his artists to a set of official themes. Rather, he permitted, even encouraged them to portray him in scenes of domestic life, caressing his wife, walking with her in the garden, or playing with his children, lifting them on his knees. Some reliefs show him visiting the sculptor's workshop in company with his queen. In the paintings like Akhenaten's daughters and the reliefs showing Akhenaten's brother and his wife, the solemn and rigid dignity of the figures in the earlier epoch are not to be found. Instead, the human body is depicted with all its frailty. They are more slender, light and graceful, moving with a natural gesticulation expressively appropriate to the themes. Instead of retaining the strict frontal view of the torso of the early formula, artists by now began to incorporate in it the protruding belly from a different angle as clearly visible in the painted relief of Akhenaten's brother. The body under transparent garments and partly exposed body in many examples reveal not only the Amarna artist's close observation of nature, but also their preoccupations with the beauty which they could find in human body. The painter who decorated the tomb of a dignitary of a new kingdom boldly shows an unprecedented figure of a maid servant from back view. The official mannerism in art hardly ever represented people except as young and beautiful. Akhenaten rejected the official mannerism in favor of truth and sincerity. In the colossal portraits of him, not only his blemishes of the face did appear, but they were emphasized with a cruelty which could be called caricature if the works themselves were not profoundly serious. He is shorn with thick lips, long chin, curvy jaws with the details of a nose ridge and eyebrows which are hardly described in the earlier epoch. His bony cheeks with wrinkles further reveal the degree of the artist's freedom and interest to move towards realism. This new tendency to become more truthful to nature also reveals itself in the way legs are treated. Irrespective of the theme or social status, the old canon allowed artists only to show both legs as seen from inside, as if one has two left legs, 
both feet were identical. In the New Kingdom, the right and left leg is unmistakably differentiated and are given lifelikeness in movement. The Old and Middle Kingdom canon set human figures firmly planted on earth. Akhenaten ruled the kingdom only for 17 years. After his death, his brother and successor Tutankhamen restored religious orthodoxy with the worship of Amen. The New Kingdom art returned to the old, but the new stylistic innovations survived in considerable measure. The interest in furniture decoration, fondness for daily life, etc., retained their hold on artistic expression as seen in the tomb of Tutankhamen. The gilt and painted wood relief of the throne of Tutankhamen found in his tomb, now in Cairo Museum, is showing the king and queen in idyllic postures. He is sitting on a chair in a comfortable, commonplace posture, which in fact was inconceivable in the old convention. Measuring against the old canon and proportion, his wife is no smaller than he, seems to be gently caressing his shoulder, appearing in a translucent garment. While the sun cord, represented as a golden orb, is stretching his hands in blessing down to them, figures to have another characteristic of Akhenaten period are still slender here. At the same time, we can also see that the old pictorial conventions were not completely soft off in the New Kingdom arts. Rather, the innovation, wherever and whatever they appear, are bold attempts to build upon the old to express new contents. Therefore, we see that the new revolutionary idea towards realism is expressed along with the old canons. The face in profile and the eye in frontal, the legs in profile, chest in frontal view, etc., still come to rule the composition. These vicissitudes tell us about an important factor in the evolution of art. Whenever at a given moment of history, art attains new heights of expression, it is soon threatened by academicism. It will become ossified and full into conventionalism unless a new style, building on earlier artistic and technical achievements, escalates a form to express a new content. Despite the rigorous discipline imposed on artists by its centuries-old canon, Egyptian art proved itself capable of revolutionary change, for it went on to create the highly original Amarna style. Despite the encouragement of the ruler himself, it was not easy for artists accustomed to working in traditional pattern to raise to the challenge. The extortion of freedom, far from making the task easier, made it much harder. Such an experiment could only be a success to the degree that a body of a trained and experienced artist already existed. So far we have confined our discussions only to the paintings and sculptures. But Egypt, as everyone knows, is immediately identified with the astonishing constructions of pyramids. However remote and mysterious they seem, the pyramids remain as symbols of kings who were so rich and powerful that they could force thousands and thousands of workers or slaves to toil year in and year out to quarry the stones and to drag and shift them to the building centers with primitive means. With all the modern technical devices and scientific knowledge, it would be still inconceivable for us today to have such a monuments constructed. The Great Pyramids at Giza, according to the Greek historian Herodotus, took 30 years to complete, of which 10 years were spent to construct the road for hauling the stones and the 20 years on the pyramid itself. The core of the pyramid was made of large stone blocks from the adjacent quarry below. Probably, 
1 lakh people comprising workers of various occupations, slaves or war captives were encaged 3 months a year consecutively for about 30 years. The height of Cheops pyramid for instance no king and no kingdom would ever dare such a trouble for the creation of a mere monument to immortalize its creator. In fact, the Egyptian pyramids were not mere monuments to immortalize themselves. It had some religious functions to serve both kings and their subjects. As mentioned earlier, the king was viewed as a divine being. His death was a departure from earth to ascend to the world of gods where he had come from. The pyramid shooting up to the sky was believed to offer him help to his ascent. That is not an end to his life, but it marks his passing away from his mortal existence to the other world. The English phrase, one passes away, finds literally meaningful in this regard. The ka or spirit of his mortal body had to be preserved from natural decaying. The deceased pharaoh, therefore, was elaborately embalmed and bound up in strips of cloth. It was for the embalmed or mummified body of the king that the pyramid had been built up. The mummified body of the king or the member of aristocracy or high official was laid on the burial ground at the right center of the huge stone mountain in rectangular shape called Mastaba in a stone coffin. In and around the pyramid were concealed large wooden boats which Horus would use in his voyage with the deceased king. One such boat recently found near the pyramid of Cheop is 131 feet long. However, it was believed that the preservation of the body, that means mummy, alone was not sufficient to ensure the deceased king's ascent to the world other than this. If likeness of the king as he was actually in his mortal life was also preserved, it would make more sure that he would continue to exist forever. King's figures were chiseled out of imperishable granite and put them in the tomb where no one saw it to keep the king alive, as one Egyptian term for sculptor means. Unlike the general assumption, the tomb of the pharaoh was not limited to a single pyramid. The pyramid is only the most important of a number of imposing structures which together form elaborate architectural complex around the actual burial place. They are closely associated with the funeral worship of the deceased pharaoh. Such funerary temples dedicated to the worship of the dead pharaoh first appeared in the Old Kingdom. The most interesting of them is the lower Chephron temple built of immense blocks of red granite and paved with the slabs of Egyptian alabaster. It is completely devoid of ornamentations or reliefs, but in front of the pillars and walls there were 23 colossal statues of the pharaoh. The development of the pyramidal architecture reached its climax in the 4th dynasty. The pyramids of Messirinus, Chephron and Cheops at Giza mark this high point. But the first was built at Saqqara by King Chaucer's architect Imhotep, who was later identified and worshipped by the Egyptians. As if by the superimpositions of the mastabas of decreasing size in the form of steps shooting up, the step pyramid occupied the center of a precinct enclosing several chapels within their courtyards. It was the first stone architecture. Earlier structures were built of mud, reeds, and dried bricks. Apart from the funerary temples and pyramids, temples dedicated to the worship of various gods were also built from the beginning of a historical period. But monumental temples with elaborate structures were entirely new creations of the new kingdom.
The increasing wealth of temple treasuries created favorable condition for the development of a classical type of Egyptian temple. Interestingly, it was at this very time that the glorification of the pharaoh's military exploits began to appear on the temple walls in the form of large reliefs of a battle and hunting scenes. The reliefs of the temple Seti at Karnak and of Ramses III at Madine, Habu, etc. bring us beautiful descriptions of such glorification which performed active function in political propaganda. But in many instances, a new statuary type portraying the pharaoh kneeling before the god was also introduced, which indirectly encrusted an idea in the society that the kings bowing to the god were also bowing to the priest, who after a spirit emerged as powerful servants of the gods. <laughs>